NASA is once again boldly going where few have gone before with the launch of a probe to one of Jupiter's moons to see whether it could support life. To tell us more about the Europa Clipper mission and Australia's part in it, we're joined by Glenn Nagel from CSIRO's Deep Space Communication Complex. A very good morning to you, Glenn. Uh, first of all, did the launch go as intended? Yeah, at exactly 3.06 this morning, local time, the Falcon Heavy rocket took off carrying Europa Clipper on this amazing voyage, 2.9 billion kilometres to get all the way to Jupiter and its icy moon, Europa. Oh, it's so exciting. Uh, OK, uh, first of all, how is it going to get there? Because it's doing a bit of a weird thing, right? It's, it's heading out, then heading back before heading out again. Yeah, this is the largest spacecraft that NASA has actually sent on an interplanetary mission. And so they need to conserve fuel. So they're going to do that by using gravity assist slingshots. They're going to be using the gravity of both Mars in February next year and then another flyby of the Earth in December. And using the gravity of those two worlds, we can slingshot the spacecraft out to Jupiter conserving fuel for the actual mission while we're at Jupiter and orbiting around that planet to make these 50 flybys of Europa. Yeah, 50 flybys. That sounds like, well, a, a heck of a lot of data, one, but also really, really risky. I mean, you're so far away from the Earth. How is that going to turn out and how long is it going to take? So it's going to take five and a half years to get there. We'll arrive around about uh, May of uh, 2030. Uh, roughly, and then I'll start the science mission. They've got to circularize the orbit, use some of the moons of Jupiter to be able to just make that orbit so it's perfect to make these 50 flybys. So around about early 2031, that's when the science will start. And some of those flybys are going to be as low as 25 kilometres above the surface of Europa. We're going to be really up close and personal with this world and really get a sense of that salty global hugging ocean below that surface. Then it might be over 100 kilometres deep and, of course, a perfect environment where life could exist. How are you going to get information about that ocean without actually touching it? So the nine instruments on the spacecraft will do a few things. We'll look at the magnetic field of the planet generated by its core, which is sort of bent and twisted as that moon orbits around Jupiter and its gravity creates heat generating that sort of warmer interior to create that ocean. We can also look for plumes of gases and watery material spraying out from the surface. This ice crust surface is sort of like Antarctica. You look at those sort of icebergs and sea ice. That's what we think it's a little bit like, but a bit thicker, maybe five to 15 kilometres thick. But we can peer below that surface and studying the magnetic field and the gravity of that world, we can understand more about the ocean, study the surface, learn about more of the composition of those materials that come up from the interior and spew out onto the surface of the planet. I really hope that there isn't one of those plumes as the craft is just 25 k's off the surface. Hey, what are you doing as part of the mission? How's Australia involved? So here in Canberra, of course, we're part of NASA's Deep Space Network, giant antennas communicating with these spacecraft. So actually about just after four o'clock this morning, we actually made first contact with the spacecraft, acquisition of signal just after it's separated from its launch vehicle and now have this two-way communication going on. So the mission team can send commands to the spacecraft. We can get telemetry back knowing that the spacecraft is healthy and on this amazing journey off to this ocean world. Does the job get harder as it gets further away? Yeah, the signals get smaller. We've got a lot of tracking to do. We need to make sure the mission knows exactly where their spacecraft is, know its speed, direction, and keep it on track for all these close planetary flybys of Mars and Earth. It needs to be very precise in those flybys so that it gets that perfect gravitational pick to pick up the speed in the direction it needs to get to its final destination. Hey, Glenn, I, I, I hate to ask you to speculate, but um, what do you reckon chances are here? Is it looking pretty likely that this is going to be the perfect place for life? Of all the places in the solar system, Europa is probably our best candidate for being a world that could support life. Now, this mission is not about finding that life, but determining whether the environment is right. Is the organic chemistry there? What is that ocean like? And those tantalising clues we get back from that science tell us, yes, this is a place where life could be and a future mission needs to go there, maybe drill down through the surface, send a little robotic sub in, sub into the subsurface ocean, turn on the light and see if anything swims up to the camera. <laughs> Glenn, I'm, you're making me so excited. I, I cannot wait. Uh, can I book you in now for 2030? 
Oh, absolutely. I'm going to be here. It's been a long night already. It's been a fabulous day. So we're really looking forward to this incredible mission. Hey, congratulations to you and the team, Glenn. We'll uh, definitely touch base again. I, I want to know more about this, more about Europa as well as this five and a half year journey takes place. Thank you so much for joining us on News Breakfast this morning. Thanks, Nick.